Welcome to the next block in our sec in our lecture, which deals with the introduction, multivariate analysis, and ordination. The contents of this block is first we introduce the multivariate analysis, then we discuss principal component analysis, analysis, subsequently redundancy analysis, and finally distance matrix and non-metric multidimensional scaling. So the learning targets of today <coughs> or of this session are first of all to explain the specifics of multivariate analysis, to be able to list different ordination methods and be able to select the one that is relevant for your research question, to explain the mathematical basis and to apply PCA and finally to interpret results that we obtain from a PCA. The mathematical details are important in the context of PCA and are mainly discussed in the context of PCA and not in subsequent methods because you are you do you understand the basis of other techniques when you understand what's going on in PCA and you will know soon what I mean by this when you have discussed several of the ordination techniques. So here you have the learning targets and study questions, so you can go through them yourself. Here additional study questions. And we start with a comparison between univariate and multivariate statistics. So in univariate statistics we had potentially one or many explanatory variables and we had one response variable. For example, we estimated the response or we assessed the response of the predipose as well as the corroboree frog two different environmental variables so we had as response the presence and absence of the frog and we had other topics um, as well like the species richness that we where we analyze the most important variables so the distribution of the response was one dimensional data format was that we had a vector and species richness and environmental variables um, is an example for such a relationship that we had in the course. So in the multivariate course this is different. We have many explanatory or potentially many. We can also have just one explanatory variable or grouping variable and we have the many response variables. For example we have the response variables a, b and c that are combined to a matrix. So the distribution is n-dimensional and an example is the response of taxa to environmental variables that can be assessed. Yeah, what are the advantages of using multivariate methods for multivariate data? That seems straightforward, but we want to briefly discuss the justification for this. First of all, I mean, you could also analyze the relationship, for example, when we have multiple taxa and multiple environmental variables, you could look at the relationship for each single species and the environmental uh, variables. If we are interested in community response, then we certainly need to look in the relationship between the environmental variables and the whole community at the same time. So we cannot answer all research questions with universe statistical methods. An additional concern is that multivariate methods allow for dimension reduction and visualization of multidimensional data, so we will see different techniques, how we can display multidimensional scaling, we have multiple variables and finally 
The joint analyze analysis can reduce the noise and increase the power of statistical tests. For example, we have um, we can add noise variables in the in the in, in statistical analysis, and when we consider several several variables in a multivariate analysis, the influence of noise variables is reduced compared to um, single variables. An overview of different multivariate approaches in R is given in the grand task view. You can click on the slide, there's a link that brings you to the grand task view. You, get, you, you, you obtain an overview of the different topics of multivariate analysis and the packages that, that R provides. So these are many packages that are available. A task view is a little bit out of date as you um, in, in on the slide, but uh, it's con constantly updated. And if you want to see novel developments, then look on the OR Forge page and the link to this page you can find in the notes to this slide. We move on to multivariate outlier checking. So several methods for exploration and diagonals are similar between multivariate and univariate analysis. For example, if we look at multicollinearity before an analysis or transformation of variables, but there are also differences and we look at two differences here. This on the one hand outlier checking and on the other hand distributional assumption checking. Regarding the outliers, we use the joint multivariate distribution to find outliers and the difference is indicated in this figure here. We see two variables plotted against each other and when we, just, when we would just look at the outliers for one variable, then we would consider the points outside of the box in this example as outliers. Why? because we only look at outliers that are out, outside of the values along one variable. So uh, that, that is the parallel lines and they form a square if combined with the, with the gradient or with the range of variable two. However, when we consider both variables jointly and this is done in for example when we calculate the mahler nobis distance i will explain later what is Mahler, how this mahler nobis distance is calculated then we assess jointly what is an outlier and that's shown here by a ellipse that is drawn and we see that it's not necessarily the same points that would be outliers for individual variables then uh, compared to those that are outliers for both variables. For the multivariate normal distribution, we see the difference here. We evaluate so we we evaluate the multivariate normal distribution. This is uh, shown here for the bivariate case on the. So the normal distribution in the univariate sense is shown on the, in the right figure, in the, in the left figure, in left, in, in red and blue individual univariate normal distributions and together they form a bivariate normal distribution that's displayed in the right figure. So we draw data from a normal multivariate normal distribution in the R example, in the R script we will do this and these data have different properties, density properties, than just using a univariate normal distribution. When we look at 
the normal distribution, we can check it visually. What we use here uh, is the we use the sample Malinovis distance to the centroid of the data and the theoretical quantiles here from the G square distribution to evaluate whether some data is normally distributed or multivariate normally distributed or not. We see on the left side data that comes from a multivariate normal distribution. So there is a slight deviation you see for small sample sizes. And on the right and right finger you see data that has been sampled from an exponential distribution. Uh, you see that the, here is a quite conspicuous deviation from the normal distribution uh, from the one-to-one -one line between the ordered and the g-square distance uh, quantiles of the distances. We have to discuss some mathematics again, some deep some background to understand PCA later and one mathematical element that we have to discuss is the so-called covariance matrix. The covariance matrix contains the different variables from our data. Um, the, the co contains the covariance for the variables from our data. So we have an initial data set with individual variables. So you could have here descriptor variables such as uh, different environmental variables or also abundance of organisms. So this is, this is our data matrix and the sample covariance matrix for these variables is provided as S. And you see that is somehow, it's, um, it's what's called sigma, it's um, smaller than our initial matrix and what it, what it contains is it contains the covariance for each of the two of each of two variables. For example, S12 is the covariance, the covariance between variable 1 and 2. S1P is the covariance between variable um, no, S2P is the covariance between the variable 2 and the variable P. And here's the calculator. Here is shown how this is done. So it's basically um, we have encountered the covariance in the universal statistics context before. It is basically the multiplication of that is given shown in the formula here. And we, this is used, you should be familiar from that, from the bivariate correlation, where this is divided by the standard deviations of the two variables. This is not done here in the covariance, but there are also correlation matrix, matrices where we divide the product by the standard, where we divide the covariance by the, by the product of the two standard deviations of the variables. Here's another description of the covariance matrix again. In the diagonal, the equation is simply the variance of the individual vari variables and above and below the diagonal, we have just the covariances of the two variables. Here we have a couple of plots with this with display of the covariance, we see along diagonal, that's always one, that's what we knew, the variance is one for the variables here. These are scaled variables. Um, and so sc scaled variables, then they have a variance of one. And we see that the covariance here is 0 0.8, which means that they are, have a positive relationship. We see here the relationship is minus 0 0.8, so they have a negative correlation. And if the covariance is zero, 
then there's basically no association between the two variables. And the final element that we need to understand is the multivariate distance in terms of Malnobis distance. And the calculation of this multivariate distance is shown in the is shown here. So you compute the distance of the vector and this is your data vector from the mean and this is weighed by the covariance that is given in the sample covariance matrix. So that is very similar to the set score that you compute in univariate statistics. The set score is shown, the calculation of the set score is shown uh, in the notes to the slide. Have a look at that. And the division by the standard deviation when you calculate the set score has the same purpose as if when as multiplication with the inverse of the sample covariance matrix precisely to standardize the difference to the sample mean centroid by the variation in the respective variable. So we basically take the distance to the mean and then standardize this with the variation in the respective variable. So much about the background of multivariate analysis. Some notes that, non notes that I uh, had on the analysis and mathematical elements that we need to understand. And we may move on to ordination. What is ordination? So ordination deals with the extraction of new axes from high dimensional data and these new axes sequentially maximize the variance. That means the first axis covers or captures the highest variance, the second, the second most variance and so on. So you hope that through, through this extraction of new axes, the first few variables, um, axes that you extract, capture the major part of the whole variance in the data. That is, is, is especially the case when there is a collinearity between the descriptors in the data set. So, you could theoretically achieve dimension reduction by omit some of the axes afterwards that capture only low amount of variance. I will give them notes of caution on, on this later on when we discuss principal component regression. You could use it to aggregate variables into gradients. We'll see later on what I mean by this. And you can achieve a graphical representation and low dimensionality as discussed before. We can't display four axes or four dimensional data at the same time. But if we achieve to, to, to um, capture most of the variation in our data with two axes, then we can easily display and visualize this. There are a couple of papers on multivariates methods with a focus on ordination and you should have a look on the notes in the notes to the slides where I give you several paper links and most of these papers are freely available. <coughs> so there are two methods of ordination that you should be familiar with. On the one hand it's unconstrained ordination. You should be able to explain what this means. That basically means that you extract the data from your data set uh, without consideration of variables outside of the data set. So that means to just take your data set, 
and you run the ordination. In constraint ordination, you extract information in your so-called response variable data set then uh, with consider by taking into account explanatory variables from a second data set. Or that would be the case if, for example, you want to explain the response of organisms to the environmental variables. That would be a constraint ordination case. So you take the environmental variables to extract the information, the species information. Whereas if you just look at the relationship between sites where species have been observed, so which sites are similar, then you just use the species data and that would be an unconstrained ordination. So here you have an overview of the different ordination methods. We don't have time to cover all of these methods in the course. These are examples of prominent methods that are used in this context. And we can classify them by how they deal with the, with the distribution of the data. If we have linear relationship in the data, so this is displayed on the next slide as well. Then we use uh, can use a PCA if we have linear gradients. If we have rather unimodal gradients, then we can should use a unimodal. Um, uh, then we should use a correspondence or analysis or different methods that capture these types of distribution of gradients, distance based. And finally, uh, smoothing techniques that rather are data driven than model driven. So we don't assume a certain, a certain distribution of the data or shape of the data, but we just fit um, a shape from the data itself. So the different, what these different acronyms mean is also stated in, this, in the notes to this slide. Have a look there. First, we have the unimodal gradient. So we see the species density increases and then against the environmental variable and then decreases again. That is a unimodal relationship between the response and the environmental variable. Of course, you're only shown for the, for the B variant case. The linear relationship, we would just look at one part of the environmental gradient. So along the environmental gradient, we just have an increase of the species density. And distance-based methods capture various relationships between species density and environmental variable. So they are relatively flexible. And finally, we have the smoothing techniques. We see here an example how the smoothing technique can capture species density that, that are neither linear or unimodal. We have two peaks of the species density against the environmental variable. So um, this is well captured by such data-driven techniques. So depending on the assumed relationship between the environmental variable and your, your response variable, you should select, um, you, you should adjust the selection of the ordination method. So we turn to PCA now. PCA is principal component analysis, and we do this with an example. The data for this is example is a famous iris data set. So these flowers, you see a picture of these flowers, and four variables of these have been measured. On the one hand, the sepal length and width, and the petal length and width for 50 flowers from three species 
of iris and you see um, an example plot um, here on the right side on the figure that's the petal width against petal width length and we see here the three different species are all indicated with different colors so what we do is when we do this in this introduction example base our aim is to represent as much variance as possible on the first few axes so the first axis should have the major variance so the number of axes is always the number of variables or descriptors in the pca data set so the first thing we do is we place the coordinate system in the center of our data so we center our data that's displayed on the right hand side and after we done we have done this we rotate our coordinate system to achieve that the maximum variability in the data is along the first axis you can already see this in the left figure that if we slightly rotate the axis then we have a much higher range along the x-axis compared to the y-axis and what we do as well is we rescale the axis based on variation along the axis so we see here that before the scale of the y-axis was from minus 3 to 3 so it had the same scaling as the x-axis so uh, one unit was the same in both dimension here we rescale that the from minus then the, that the axis ranges from minus one to one and this is done to achieve a clearer separation between the points along the y-axis so one unit the, the distance along the second axis is not the same distance as along the y-axis uh, along the x-axis so that's important to understand generally in ordination methods that the differences at the distances depend on how much of the variance is captured along one axis so we won't discuss scaling in detail in the course but there are different ways to scale the axis and this is described in the literature and in the R vignette to which I referred you to. What we obtain out of the PCA is then this plot. So we have a separation of the data um, and we can this is a way of visualize the relationships between our objects and on the other hand we have some results on the right hand side of this slide and we, for example the total variation of the data <coughs> that is the total variance and we obtain information on the importance of components on the one hand and these are the so-called eigenvalues the proportion explained and the cumulative proportion that sound may sound a little bit difficult for you at the moment but you will understand these terms later on yeah the total variation is clear it's, it's 3.7 if you would uh, calculate the individual variance for petal width and petal length we would see that the sum of these is 3.7 that's how we obtain this um, eigenvalues are explained later on and we see that the first axis is explains 99 percent of variation so if we just look along the the first axis we would already capture most of the variability in our data set and we could interpret the relationship between objects for example sampling sites by just looking at the distance along the first axis. 
However, we want to understand what's going on mathematically in the PCA and we do this by choosing an example, namely the PISA study. And I choose this because this has been nicely displaced in, displayed in the literature. So what we have is initially we have some scores in mathematics and reading. You know that pupils are ranked in PISA according to their performance in different areas of education. So here we have mathematics and reading and we have five countries for illustration that have different points. So our aim is now to We start first by centering the data as before. So that is shown here by the red cross on the figure. And you see the, cent the matrix of the centered variable. So we have the, this tilde on top of the variable that indicates that we have an estimate instead of an head. So in the context of multiple regression analysis, you had, you had an a x or y head. So here we have a tilde and it indicates it's an estimate for a transformed variable because the centering represents, represents a transformation. So the centering changes these different points, changes the points. You don't need to scale the, the, the variables here because they are basically on the same scale. And our aim is now to search for the first axis with the maximum variation in the data that's shown here in these dashed lines in the figure. That's just the visual estimate how the PCA, one, the first PC axis and the second principal component uh, will look like. So let us translate this search for the axis with the maximum variation into something more palatable. We have uh, scores. These scores express what the coordinates are of the initial transformed objects on the new principal component axis. So for principal component axis one. Just let's focus on this case here. We would have the initial coordinates of the center variable x1 and x2 with a tilde. And to obtain the new coordinates, we would need to multiply them by two unknown factors, by two unknown variables a1 and a2. And this would result in the scores on PC1. Now, what does it mean that we look for the maximum variation? We need to have an argument of these for these scores that we search for the maximum variance A1 multiplied X1, the estimated transformed variables X1, and so on. We can generalize this problem and A1 and A2 are elements of a vector. These vectors we will later call eigenvectors and we consider that X1 and X2 are elements of the matrix X and can rewrite this whole problem as maximum of A is the variance A times the matrix of transformed variables, the centered variables. Now a very trivial solution would be that for the individual elements in this vector we choose, so in, in, in the eigenvector, we choose just very high values because obviously if we choose very high values for a1, a2, and so on, then we obtain a very high 
number and we inflate the variance. So we need to somehow introduce a condition that limits the, the, the value uh, that we can put for a1, a2 and so on for the individual elements of the eigenvector. And we say that the sum of the squares of the elements of the vector is should should not exceed one. So this is shown here by the introduction of the condition. For the PISA example, just imagine we set different a1s and a2s. So the value of a1 with, with, with which we multiply x1 and the value of a2 with, with, with which we multiply x2 in the example. Um, we could, for example, set a1 to 1 and a2 to 0. Then we obtain just the variance for x1 because um, x a2 is 0. If we set a1 to 0 0.6 and a2 to 0 0.8, this would be another this would be another set of variables that yields to one that meets the condition of one, then we find a certain variance and we can choose different tuples of of values that have an R and an, that if squared and summed up, summed up yield one and we need to find that one that maximizes the variation. So that has the maximum number, the maximum variance here. So expressed differently, we search for the maximum variance of the problem of a multiplied with the matrix under the condition that the vector A multiplied with, with the, the transposed vector equals 1. And this case can be expressed um, as in, in a different form because the, the transcentered matrix of transformed values, uh, when we search the variance for this, we can just use the covariance matrix here and we multiply the covariance matrix with the with the transposed vector of a and again with a under the condition a t multiplied a equals one now maximizing an argument you may notice from different fields of science. It's for example used in economics as well. You can use a Lagrange function to maximize, the, to, to implement this function and as uh, and when we implement both conditions into this function. So we choose the first part AT multiplied with the covariance variance matrix multiplied A minus lambda times and then we have the condition that the vector multiplied with its transposed should yield uh, one implemented in the, in the brackets. So now that we want to maximize, we look for, we differentiate to find the peak of this function and we differentiate for, for A. And if we do this, you see here on the, on the top and um, on the bottom second equation from the bottom you see the differentiation for a and we see that two times this covariance matrix multiplied was a minus two times lambda times alpha and uh, minus times a a and this can be re reformulated to the variance covariance matrix multiplied with a equals lambda times a. And this is in fact the so-called eigenvalue problem.
And this is the eigenvalue problem, and this eigenvalue problem will we will discuss in the next slides in a general form, not specifically in the context of PCA. But you need to understand this because this eigenvalue problem is the basis for many techniques in um, ordination and in the multivariate um, real. So we proceed with the eigenvalue problem and the idea is that a matrix is converted into a matrix with linear independent variables. So you have an initial matrix and afterwards you have a matrix where the variables are linearly independent. That means you have only values along the diagonal. So we have encountered before that if you have, for example, would have the covariance of uh, two descriptors in uh, above or below the diagonal and this would be zero, then there is no relationship between the variables. So the eigenvalue problem is generally written as we have an initial matrix A multiply with the so-called eigenvectors and we obtain the matrix and this is the same as the matrix of eigenvalues multiplied with the eigenvector. What does this mean geometrically? This means we have some eigenvectors x1 and the position x1 and x2 um, provide the point of an object and the eigenvalues they stretch or shrink this point to reach the initial point in a matrix A times A multiplied with X. So the eigenvalue problem can also be written as a linear function where we multiply the eigenvector um, with the eigenvalue and this vector is only stretched or shrunk. And this matrix of eigenvalues is called the canonical form and that's what you encounter as a term in many of the methods, for example canonical correspondence analysis, canonical correlation and so on. So geometrically the eigenvector represents the rotation of initial coordinates in, a, in, in the initial coordinate system and the eigenvalue um, just stretches the vector to its position. So on the no in the notes to this slide you find a couple of examples of matrices how they rotate rotate or stretch different points. So let us reformulate the eigenvalue problem. Um, you see reformulation here in the equation, so we end up with the equation matrix A minus the eigenvalue times the identity matrix. So we ignore the trivial solution that x equals zero. This leads us to the equation the matrix A minus the eigenvalues times the identity matrix equals zero, zero vector. And putting this into a different matrix form, rewriting this is shown in the middle of the slide. And this is, is a homogeneous linear equation system. Now we know that for a homogeneous linear equation system, um, that this has a unique solution, um, that all x are the same and all are zero. And if this would be a singular, matrix, uh, a singular matrix, at least one row is a, is a linear combination of the other rows. 
So that means at least one x is independent from zero. And in this case, you don't have a unique solution. That means you can have enter different values for x. Um, you just have relationships between the x. You don't have one unique solution. And the non-trivial in this non-trivial case, the determinant is zero. And since we want to look for the case, or since we search for the case where not all x are zero, not all elements of the eigenvectors are zero, we look for the case where the determinant of uh, the determinant is zero, hence the matrix is singular. This is shown um, that is shown in on this in the last equation of this slide. Now let's look at an example, what this means to illustrate. So we have a sample variance covariance matrix from the PISA data where we have the variances along the diagonal and we have the covariances given in uh, above and below the diagonal. And when we now calculate the, this, um, then we have, when we want to calculate this, we have the matrix A, the variance covariance matrix, minus lambda times the identity matrix. We reformulate this to minus uh, the matrix, the lambda in the diagonals. Of course, in reality or in, in uh, let's for the time being just keep lambda here. So we calculate now um, that we may do the matrix calculation so we have 345.7 minus lambda and 1000 1071.3 minus lambda and the determinant of that equals zero now for for small determinants we can calculate the determinant the determinant by hand and it is done here for a times d minus b times c. Have a look at the notes to the slide to understand um, what is a, b, c, and d in our case. And this is shown here. So a times d is um, the first element, um, the, the top left element multiplied with the bottom right element minus um, minus b times c, so that means um, 528 squared. So we can reformulate this because this is basically a polynomial problem. Um, we know that um, this is, uh, we, we search for the lambda that we will search for the solution for this equation for lambda. And this is a quadratic equation and we know the solution from school for quadratic equations. We also know that when we can, we could plot this to find the solutions where we have the function of the lambda equals zero. So we obtain two lambdas in this case that meet our conditions. In the next example, we want to calculate eigenvalues and vectors. And we start with this matrix that is shown on the top left of this figure. We don't go into details here how we calculate the eigenvalues, uh, but we can use the rule of Saru. You can look up this rule uh, in, a, in a textbook or even in Wikipedia, we will find this, how you can obtain the eigenvalues following this rule. This, this rule. Anyway, we have, based on this matrix, you have the characteristic polynome that is shown here. And you have, uh, you see in the figure, if you would plot this characteristic polynome, then you would easily find out that the eigenvalues are lambda, four, zero, and minus one. You can 
we can also see that this is rather an example not for a real PC8 because we wouldn't have negative eigenvalues in a real PCA. We only have positive eigenvalues for the individual axis. But this is just for illustration how the calculation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors works. So we calculate here the eigenvector for lambda equals equal 4. So how do we do this? Again, we set up the initial, we use the initial brain's covariance matrix minus lambda times the identity matrix multiplied with x1 equals 0. So we put in the eigenvalues and the eigenvalue is here 4. We rearrange and we obtain this equation system. So we know that if we would put x1 equals x2 equals x3, then all x would be x0. This would be one solution. So we ignore this and we can do this by fixing the value of one variable. For example, we define x1 as 1. So when we define x1 as 1, the equation system changes. You see in the, in the bottom row, now we have 1 plus 4 times x2 minus 3 x3 equals 0. And when we solve this equation system, then we obtain x1 as x as 1, x2 uh, as 2, and x3 as 3. So this would be the first eigenvector for this matrix. So we have 1, 2, 3 as eigenvectors. Note that in this time of uh, this type of eigenvector calculation, we ignore the condition that the eigenvectors, the sum of the eigenvectors, um, um, should be should be um, one and this is not fulfilled here obviously if you calculate the eigenvector if you multiply the eigenvector with the transpose of the eigenvector that does not uh, yield one So now that we know what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are and have a basic understanding of how PCA works, we look more into the results of the PCA and something that you obtain are the so-called PC scores, the principal component scores. And these show the positions of the object, the new scores of the object um, when on the new on the new components that we have derived, so on the new axis with maximum variance. And these PC scores result from multiplication of the scores from the initial axis um, with the eigenvectors. So how many principal components do we typically have? We've already discussed that this depends on the number of descriptors or explanatory variables, whatever you have in your data set, and this will yield the number of eigenvalues and thus principal components. So the largest eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector explain the highest share of total variance, and that will typically be the first axis or the first component. If the aim is to represent a major variation with a few principal components, then this leads us to the question how many components are needed. And on the figure you see a couple of examples how many axis you would need for different data. You, so you see that if the data is completely scattered around three dimensions, that's the figure to the left, 
then you also would need three relevant components. If all the data is in a plane, that's the middle figure, middle figure, then we only would need two components. And if they all are on one line, then you would only need one component to represent the major variation of the data. So we somehow need a criteria to evaluate the number of components that we need. So let us discuss some criteria that have been developed to evaluate the number of principal components that are needed. And one of these criteria is the sum criteria. Or note before that there is no single accepted criterion that works under all conditions because it also depends why you are doing a principal component analysis. So if your aim is prediction, let's say, um, or principal component regression, then the sum criterion may be acceptable for you because you want to know how much of the original variance is captured by the, by the selected number of components. And to do this, you set an alpha that gives the number, the, the, the proportion of cumulated variance that you want to preserve. And the sum criterion tells you how many of the principal components you may, you may you need to keep to arrive at this amount of total uh, of this fraction of cumulative variance. For example, you could set an alpha of 0 0.9, which means that you would take as many principal components that are needed to, to capture 90% of the original variance. Typical, typically, value between 0 0.7 and 0 0.9 is chosen for alpha. However, the optimal alpha will decrease with an increase in the number of variables in the data set. Anyway, this is more a heuristic criterion or a criterion that is ad hoc set. Another criterion that has foundation or it is uh, theoretically motivated is the prognostic criterion. It's the second criterion here where you imagine that you have a stick of unit length and you break this in a couple of pieces um, many times. And then the amount of variance that is um, provided by the, by the um, individual, by the resulting pieces is sorted in decreasing order and you compare the size to the eigenvalues from this broken stick model. So you can read a little bit more in the, in the notes to this slide. I don't go into detailed explanation here, just one motivating or one explaining thought that is not too difficult. If you have um, a stick and break it in two parts many, many times, then on average you will have, or you, you could at the extremes have two sticks of the same length. That would mean that both have the length 0 0.5. Or on the other hand, they could break that one stick is more or less, has the length of almost one and the other one is infinitely small. So on average, we obtain a, a breaking point at 75%. You can see that if you do the calculations. So what does this mean? If we had two variables in our PCA, we would say by if we just break random the variance, then 75% would be on the first axis and 25% on the second axis. And if our variance for the first axis is smaller, then we would evaluate that a random uh, variable would yield more variance on the first axis. Um, then, uh, and, and then it's perhaps not meaningful and we don't need to keep that component. 
Then we have the scree plot. In the scree plot, we look for an alloy point. So scree is the rubble from from um, some uh, if if some stones fall down from the cliff, then they build up as rubble. And in a scree plot, you search for the beginning of the scree of this rubble that piles up at the bottom from the cliff. So you search for this largest drop and it's indicated with the error where this largest drop would be. Again, this is rather a sub subjective technique because you may also argue that the PC number five, you would evaluate that the, that the screen begins. So it's rather a subjective criterion. So a more objective criterion is finally cross-validation, where we minimize the mean square error of prediction that's shown here. So we remove and cross-validation, you already, we've already discussed this. Um, we remove from the matrix different values and we use, we later on predict these values based on our based on our principal component analysis and this is then for different number of principal components this is done and we average here by the number of um, the average this for the number of principal components if we do this multiple times and we search for the number of principal components that minimizes this mean square error of prediction. There are also some statistical tests, but they are in many cases less reliable than cross-validation and they are sensitive to deviations from the multivariate normal distribution, so we don't discuss them here in the course, but you can relate to the literature to look into more into the details. So now that we know how many components we need, we need to discuss and when we have our results how we can evaluate the relevance of the initial descriptors or variables for the different principal components. This is done or this is evaluated based on the eigenvectors because the elements of the eigenvectors are the so-called loadings and I have displayed on this slide the an eigenvector matrix for, uh, for a case of three variables as a result of the whole analysis, you would have these matrix of eigenvectors for, and they, and they stand for the eigenvectors on PC1, PC2, and PC3. And each of these elements of the eigenvectors for PC1 would be the loading of the descriptor 1, 2, and 3. So they represent the weight of the original descriptors on the PCs. So on the relative or in relation to each other, you can interpret the weight of the different descriptors. However, if you want to have a more, uh, an easier way to interpret these is to obtain correlation loadings. The correlation loadings are obtained if you multiply the, these eigenvectors with the square root of the eigenvalues. Well, note that correlation loadings are equivalent to correlating the original descriptors with the PC scores. And note also that the term loadings is used differently in textbooks. So some, some textbooks use loadings for this correlation loadings and whereas in R loadings are basically the elements of the eigenvectors.
One problem may be that if you have many variables, then more or less all variables may contribute at least to a small extent to each of the principal components and that makes the interpretation very difficult. For example, let's say that, you have, that we have six or seven principal components and variables and each of the variables contributes a little bit to each of the axes, some more, some less. So how do you interpret then the individual axes? It is relatively difficult if you have many variables and in the R case example you will see this for the case of 14 variables. So one solution is here to conduct a sparse PCA and this introduces a penalty term to the maximization problem that we've already discussed. This is similar interpretation as for the lasso that we have discussed in more detail in the course before in the context of multiple linear regression analysis. So the motivating idea is that we set a penalty on the size of the, of the elements of the eigenvectors and basically we want to shrink some of the loadings to zero and increase the loadings of others and this equals that or this means that in the end we have some descriptors that play no role because their loading becomes zero whereas other descriptors become um, um, gain a higher weight. So this is somehow clear, it's called sparse PCA and this is used if we want to have a clearer interpretation of individual principal components, for example, if we use them in follow-up analyses. For more details, refer to the notes to this slide and read the literature. Note also, I mean, the, note also that the lambda that is used here in the penalty term in the equation maximum variance of a times the transformed and centered matrix x minus lambda times this is this lambda is not an eigenvalue that is very confusing here in the context of pca but we have to stick to the terminology that is used in the papers it's called that's the the lambda that is optimized um, the, the lambda penalty that is optimized and you know this already from lasso but don't confuse this with the lambda uh, and that is used for the eigenvalues that's also the result of a maximization problem we turn to the pca assumptions and diagnosis so the assumptions of PCA are, and that's known from other data analysis methods in the Unified case that we've discussed before, is that the observations are independent so that we have temporal and spatial independence, that we, that we have multivariate normality, although this assumption is not required for all analysis, for example, it is not required if we only want to visualize the if you only want to visualize the data um, this can be done reliably even for discrete variables as long as the data values are numerical and the distances between the discrete values meaningful um, if you use it in regression analysis the results of the principal component analysis, analysis then multivariate normality is required and many hypothesis meth methods, testing methods would also require a multivariate normality. Another assumption is that we have no serials, serious outliers, otherwise you can use the robust PCA. In fact, in the course, um, we mainly use the robust PCA. Um, if you want to read no more details about this, uh, read chapter 3.5 in Vamusa and Filzmosa. So in the context of multiple linear regression we discussed leverage points and, and outliers from the model and we have something 
similar in the space of the of the PCA we have on the one hand we have score distances that are something like leverage points these are just very different in the scores and in the space and the distance to the other objects so they may have a higher weight in modeling and we also have orthogonal distances that is the difference to the PCA space and these orthogonal outliers are displayed as well as deviation from the PCA space um, in, in the figure. And as we discussed before, leverage points, if a, if a point is a leverage point and an orthogonal outlier, then we have, um, may, may have a problem and these are most problematic points. So these are they are more influential than other points and we should remove them um, and repeat the analysis. However, if you do a robust PCA, this will in most cases not really matter. Yeah, generally the PCA also assumes that you have a linear gradient of descriptors this is rarely the case for species data, although you can transform the species data, for example, by Hellinger transformation to achieve, to achieve a linear relationship. But in it, uh, for environmental data, for example, yeah, as the soil data that we use or other environmental variables, there, this is more often given that we have a linear gradient of the descriptors. Euclidean distances are often inappropriate for species data because you have many double zeros, so joint absences are very often um, uh, occurring and we will discuss this later on, what this means, why this is inappropriate in the context of distance math measures. And one additional problem is that if you add noise variables to the data, this increases the fraction of variance on the first axis but this has no meaning. It is overall a useful technique in exploratory analysis and for analyzing environmental data or other data with linear gradients. Um, it helps you to display the data um, and you obtain the best results if you have a large n and high n to p ratio, but it is not surprising that holds actually for many methods. So we look at the brief tutorial for PCA. First, you check if conditions for the descriptors are met, depending on your research question. You conduct the PCA or sparse PCA on the scale descriptors unless they exhibit a similar variation and have been or have been measured on the same scale. Then you check for outliers, you determine the number of principal components, and you evaluate how informative the first two PCs are, because it's important to know when you plot the data, for example, in the B plot on the first two components. And then, depending on your what your interest is, you may evaluate the contribution of individual descriptors to the PCs, and finally, yeah, plot the PC, um, it would perhaps with the descriptors and interpret the results what you see or extract and afterwards perhaps extract um, the scores for principal component regression and that's discussed as last um, aspect of principal component analysis. The last topic we discuss in the context of principal Component analysis is principal component regression. We've mentioned this term a couple of times and this is the last issue we want to discuss here. The idea of principal component regression is that first you use the descriptors in a principal component analysis and then you extract the unscaled PC scores 
to use these as new descriptors in multiple regression analysis. But why should we do this? The motivating idea is that if you have multicollinearity among the variables, then this can be fixed because the new principal components that are extracted are orthogonal. So they are completely independent from one each other. You don't have any problem with multicollinearity anymore. In addition, if you, if you use, for example, the sparse PCA, you may extract gradients of joint variables, that's also principal components that are representative for a couple of variables that represent more meaningful gradients. For example, gradients of water quality, where the variables, uh, where the initial quality variables such as pH, oxygen content, and so on, are correlated with these. And the other principal components uh, um, are can be interpreted for other environmental gradients, for example, in terms of, in, in the given example of water quality, uh, water quality gradients. On the one hand, this can be habitat gradients or climate gradients or something else. Often, these principal component regression is also used in the context of low N to P situations. So when you have relatively low number of samples or observations per parameter in the model. Because if you remove the last principal components, then you can reduce the number of predictors. So for example, you keep only the principal components that explain 90 to 95% of the variance and you remove the other ones and then you have a lower number of predictors in your multiple regression model. While this is often done and seems appealing, the problem is that the low variance the last PCs, so the last principal components in the models, do not necessarily imply that they have a low explanatory power for the response variable. So there can be situations, and I refer you to the notes to this slide, where the low variance PCs exhibit a high explanatory power for response. So the, the um, low variance PCs cannot autom should not automatically be, uh, be removed and principal component regression provides not necessarily a fix for low and to P ratios.